holding the title of the last 12-inch armed battleship in the United States Navy, and also the last 12-inch armed battleships to see combat service, the Wyoming class lived far longer than anyone could have expected. They would be launched before the First World War, and both ships of the class would see out the end of the Second World War, albeit in wildly different roles. In this, they would outlive many of their contemporaries, and many newer ships and other navies for that matter. Not a bad run, though only Arkansas would see active combat. Wyoming? Well, Wyoming had a much quieter, though definitely no less important, life. Training the next generation of sailors can often be just as important as serving on the front lines, after all. Before we can get into that, though, the design of the ship should be covered. American dreadnought design practice, from the very first to the very last, can generally be summed up in one way. Progressive improvements and standardization. This isn't to say there weren't notable changes made, definitely not, though these changes were often tied to more general improvements and would, in turn, create a new standard to follow. This can be seen with Delaware through Wyoming, and then with Nevada through Colorado. In this regard, Wyoming is a follow-on to the first three classes of dreadnought. The South Carolinas began as penny-pinching ships, small and slow with only eight 12-inch guns. Realizing fairly quickly that these ships were outdated and ineffective compared to other dreadnoughts, the development of the Delaware class would see a shift to bigger ships with more guns and speed, albeit marginally thinner armor. In those ships, you saw a switch to 10 12-inch guns and 5 twin turrets. The exact same layout would be repeated on the Florida class. As such, Wyoming would be the next of the gradual improvements in American design. Not that she was originally intended to be such. Just as had been the case with the preceding Florida class, there was a concerted push to move towards 14-inch guns. Overseas, the British were moving to 13.5-inch guns with the Orion class. The Super Dreadnought Age had arrived. It made logical sense to, thus, make the jump in caliber on American ships as well, though to 14-inch instead of 13.5. The problem becomes that there wasn't actually a 14-inch gun to use, not even to test. Delays in construction to wait for a gun to be properly tested would have been far too heavy a price to pay when the United States can only get a couple dreadnoughts a year and was already falling rapidly behind a number of battleships. Furthermore, the increase in displacement would also cause issues with existing support infrastructure and ports. The result of these concerns would see Wyoming change from the initially desired 8 to 10 14 inch guns into a 12 gun broadside of 12 inch guns. There was also an increase in the caliber of the 12 inch guns from 12 inch 45 to 12 inch 50. While certainly not as good as jumping to bigger guns, these longer weapons had higher velocity and better armor penetration compared to the older dreadnoughts. The result of this is that the Wyomings are arguably the best of the 12-inch armed battleships, having a heavy broadside of excellent guns on fairly heavily armored ships. This should, though, be remembered as coming at a time when European navies were starting to move to heavier guns. The ships carried these guns in three sets of super-firing turrets. Two twin turrets on the bow, two right behind the superstructure, and a final pair on the long stern. This is the classical turret farm kind of layout, though far and away not the worst of the type. Her secondary armament was less of an improvement, consisting of the same 5-inch 51 caliber guns as on the older dreadnoughts. Wyoming simply carried more of them, mounting 21 to Florida's 16. These were, furthermore, mounted a deck higher in the hull as a response to issues with the usability of the lower mounted guns. However, they were still very wet, as was the case with all hull-mounted casements. Rounding out her usable, for a certain value of usable, weaponry were two 21-inch torpedo tubes. Right, with that summary done, shall we move on to the ship herself? USS Wyoming was laid down on February 9, 1910, in Philadelphia. Her launch on May 25, 1911, was fairly quick, all things considered, as would be her commissioning on September 25, 1912, 
there have certainly been slower ships when it comes to getting into service. It does, however, still come after HMS Orion, which puts Wyoming as somewhat outdated upon her commissioning, though she was still better off than some American battleships, as she was fitted with turbines, which let her maintain her 21-knot top speed. Compared to the follow-on New Yorks, which reverted to triple expansion engines. In any case, her initial service can be summed up the same way as just about any American dreadnought before Nevada. Traditional peacetime training and patrols, interspersed with port visits as far afield as the warm Mediterranean. She visited there in November 1913, which means she just missed getting to see the Second Balkan War, with the result that her European voyage was completely uneventful. Wyoming returned back to the United States and her same old, same old routine. The only other excitement prior to World War I would be another tradition for pre-standard American dreadnoughts, sailing down to Veracruz to taunt the Mexicans a bit. With that done and her peacetime duties returning, we see nothing else of note until the United States entered the Great War in 1917. At that point, Wyoming finally got a chance to do something different and exciting. Namely, as I mentioned in previous videos, joining the Grand Fleet and taunting Germany this time. As also mentioned in those other videos, the British had a distinct lack of oil for ship fuel, but an overabundance of coal. The result here is that when the United States offered battleships to beef up the blockade on Germany, the British requested the older coal-burning ones instead of the brand new Nevadas. Wyoming would be one of the first to head for the British Isles, arriving there with the newer New York and the older Delaware and Florida on December 7, 1917. While part of the American Battleship Division 9, these four dreadnoughts would be the 6th Battle Squadron of the Grand Fleet. Unfortunately for the excitement of the crew, though perhaps fortunately for their life expectancy, this is well after the Battle of Jutland. If the High Seas Fleet was unwilling to challenge just the British again, they certainly weren't going to challenge the British and their new American reinforcements. This doesn't mean that Wyoming saw no excitement at all. She would escort a convoy to Norway on February 6, 1918, with other American battleships and British destroyers. During this, Wyoming had to dodge torpedo wakes on the 8th, which strongly implies a U-boat trying to get a lucky hit on her. Those torpedoes would miss, though, and Wyoming returned to patrol duties and convoy escorts. With the crews of the High Seas Fleet objecting strenuously to a suicidal death ride for the pride of the service, the only time Wyoming would see the German fleet would be upon their surrender and internment in Scapa Flow. On November 21st, 1918, Wyoming would join New York, Texas, and her sister Arkansas in helping escort the Germans to their internment. After a follow-on stint escorting President Wilson to the peace conferences, Wyoming returned back to the United States. She would spend the following few years training places between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans on a return to her original peacetime duties. During this time, one William Halsey would spend a stint as her executive officer which is an interesting historical side note, if nothing else. In 1927, Wyoming went in for an extensive modernization. This would see her fitted with new oil-fired boilers, as well as torpedo blisters to improve her underwater protection. The biggest change, visibly, was probably the replacement of her stern lattice mast with a small tripod, and a new superstructure higher up for some of her 5-inch guns. Unlike her sister Arkansas, Wyoming would spend very little time in this refit form. With the London Naval Treaty placing further restrictions on signatory navies in 1930, Wyoming was placed in reduced commission at the start of 1931 for demilitarization, the same as USS Utah. Only while Utah replaced North Dakota as a target ship, at least initially, Wyoming was converted to a proper training ship. This consisted of removing her torpedo blisters, guess those only lasted a couple years, eh? And her side armor. As well as the guns and machinery from three of her six turrets. In this state, she would become a full-on trainer, instead of just going on cruises as an active warship. Not even a year into this process, though, she would come to the rescue of the Nautilus. No, not that one, and definitely not the nuclear one either. 
This was an ice-cutting submarine of a British Arctic explorer, Hubert Wilkins, that also happened to be an ex-U.S. Navy sub. With that rescue done, Wyoming would go about her business. Redesignated to AG-17 to reflect her new role in no longer being an active battleship, she would spend the remainder of the 1930s performing valuable, if not exactly headline-grabbing, duties. Her training would take her across oceans, and see many, many men sail in her to learn their trade. She would even get the chance, starting in the mid-30s, to branch out a bit. In this case, by helping support exercises intended to test out naval landings. This kind of practice would prove to be very valuable in a few years, though it was probably not expected at the time. Continuing largely in the same roles for the rest of the decade, brief breaks to visit Europe aside, Wyoming had a quiet life, at least until 1941, at which point she would be changed up again, this time to a dedicated gunnery training ship. She would be performing this role when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, though that would do little to change Wyoming's role. This task would see various guns fitted aboard her, from 5-inch to machine guns. Thousands of gunners would train on her during this period, as Wyoming stayed far, far away from combat duty. While her sister joined in active service, the mostly disarmed battleship would get the nickname Chesapeake Raider for how much time she spent on gunnery training in Chesapeake Bay. Later on in the war, in early 1944, Wyoming would have her final major refit at Norfolk. This would give her the distinctive form she is probably more famous for, in spite of it only lasting a couple years of her multi-decade service, and also the reason for the title of this video. She would lose her remaining 12-inch turrets, having them replaced by twin-mount 5-inch guns, two where her bow turrets once were, and one at her sternmost former turret. Couple these with a further twin turret mounted on her side, along with two single mounts, and Wyoming carried ten 5-inch guns in this style. This alongside various other guns, from 20mm to 40mm to 3-inch, that would see her carrying what would be a fairly heavy anti-aircraft battery. However, these were only training weapons. She wasn't laid out to use them in proper combat. She had fire control and radar to aid in her role and for experimentation, but she was definitely not going to be charging off and putting up a field of anti-aircraft fire over a convoy or something. Even so, with this impressive light weaponry layout, Wyoming would fire a lot of shells. As one example, in November 1944, she would fire 3,033 5-inch shells, 839 3-inch, 10,076 40 mm, 32,231 20 mm, and 66,270 30 caliber machine gun bullets, as well as 360 1.1-inch cannon shells. That is just one month. She would gain the distinction of firing off more ammunition than any single ship in the entire USN, training up to 35,000 gunners aboard her. Come June 1945, she would see another role, being assigned to develop anti-kamikaze tactics. In this, she would have been under the command of Admiral Willis Lee of USS Washington fame. Sadly, he would suffer a heart attack on the way to taking up his post aboard her which is a distinction Wyoming could probably have dealt without. She would continue in this final role, expanded to cover new fire control devices until 1947. She would be decommissioned at last on August 1st, 1947. In this, she would ultimately outlive her sister, as her crew and some equipment would be transferred to her replacement, USS Mississippi. Wyoming would be sold for scrap by the end of that year, ending a long and fairly quiet career, in spite of almost returning to active service when the USN was desperate enough after Pearl Harbor to consider refitting her as a proper battleship. Since that didn't happen, she would not see any active combat, but Wyoming's role was critical for the survival of many a ship in the Pacific Theater, where gunners trained aboard her would prove their worth time and time again. That is a legacy anyone can respect, I think. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the content, and I'll see you in the next one.